All right, everybody. we're going to go ahead and start. So we've got a few people still logging on, but uh, feel free to come on. I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute everybody and turn your video off. If I haven't gotten to you yet and you want to do that yourself, that'd be great too. But we're going to keep it um, to try to keep the noise down to a minimum if everybody can keep their video and audio off during the presentation. So welcome to our second installment of Symphonic Music Revealed, Behind the Scenes with the Conductor. Uh, my name's Molly Sweet, and I'm a member of the Civic Orchestra um, in the clarinet section, as well as a member of the board. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about, uh, our topic is why some pieces are so popular. Um, so before we get into that, just make sure you know the housekeeping, we go over some things, so the video and audio, and also if you have any questions during the um, presentation, you can type them into the chat box. And uh, at the end, we're going to have some Q&A time, so feel free to, anytime you have a question, think of it, um, type it in, and we'll, we'll address it at the end. So I'd like to introduce today's moderator, um, Cindy Zarsky. Cindy uh, made her professional career as a microbiologist. In her retirement, she's focusing on her personal passion of music. Cindy actually plays second violin and is the secretary of the Civic Orchestra's board. So I'm going to turn it over to Cindy today. Um, thank you so much for moderating, and we'll get right into it. All right. Okay. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everyone, for tying in on a lovely, hot Florida summer afternoon. Um, I want to thank Marguerite right up front for taking the time to do this. And since we are sticking to a hard 45-minute time frame, I'm just going to jump right into the questions, Marguerite. Mm -hmm. All right. um, when we talked about how you wanted to structure this presentation, you mentioned that you really wanted to start with a broad picture of music and then and then sort of focus down and narrow it. So the, the first question I have is, you know, given the fact that music is often called the universal language, can you talk for a bit about the science as well as the neuroscience behind our perception of music? Um, sure. Um, thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Molly, for the introductions. Um, so yes, you're right. For the time limit, let's just jump right in. Um, I'm going to start with the fact that I'm a musician and not a neuroscientist. I, I know there are scientists, doctors joining us, um, but just to focus a little bit on on the the perception that a human has of music. I mean, you have to go to the brain, and I think one of the most interesting things. Um, I don't know, Molly, if you're able to pull up. Um, the photograph that I sent uh, in your screen share of um, the human brain um, in a normal resting position versus a human brain when it is exposed to music. <laughs> so I think if you look at the image on the left, you can see there's, uh, and red indicates activity. Um, if you look at the brain on the right, you see that the brain is considerably more active and the amazing thing with music is it's not one or two spots but so many different spots in the brain and i think if you take that into consideration thank you molly that's that's great <laughs> i think if you take that into consideration um you understand why music is so related to medicine and is so related to healing so for example uh, Alzheimer's patients who have maybe lost some verbal skills or verbal um, cognition and um, speech abilities can be reached through music. Someone who has not communicated for years, if they play music, will start singing, moving, um, knowing the lyrics. Um, so I, that's, you know, music therapy and speech pathology. I, uh, experts utilize this knowledge of how music, because it does go to different brain centers, stroke patients, again, whose speech center has been, you know, not made functional, can have speech retaught through experiencing music and patterns of speech that are presented in a musical context. So I think there's no separating the science from the, the music. You know, today's focus is, is about the popularity, but I think we have to start, like you were saying, at the broadest point. So it, you can't know a favorite until you know why you're even perceiving it the way you are. Um, 
I think the, the first thing we want to think about in that universal, universality, universality of music is that every culture, no matter how connected or communicating with other cultures or how uh, isolated the culture is, civilization throughout the world, there is music. And there's often a music, music associated with different emotional periods, either mourning, grief, through sadness and loss, or joy, or religious, very spiritual ceremonies. So music is, it truly is that universal language, and I do believe that is because there's a brain uh, involved. Um, you yourself, Cindy, found some very interesting information on a flute that was found from Neanderthal period. That actually, if you make a like a model, I guess like a 3D model of it, plays musical notes that would be familiar to our ear. And that's Neanderthal period. That's a pretty long time ago. So music, I think, started early and has lasted a long time because of that. The, it's in our brains. Um, I think if we kind of move forward to trying to figure out, you know, popularities, things that we like, things that others like, groups, things that groups like, I think you have to get a little bit into how the brain hears the music. It's not just how it reacts, but but certain sounds and frequencies. Because of course, if we get in, we won't go into the inner ear and the hammer and the, the stirrup. But um, if we get into just you know basic how we hear. Um, you know, we are hearing frequencies of sound. We're hearing a, a, a wave of sound. And pretty much if you go back to early, early music, you can find obviously a flute made of bone, but stringed instruments. Uh, in fact, I started thinking about this. Pretty much every culture has instruments that involve a string, instruments that involve something you blow into, and instruments that involve something you hit or strike, like percussion. So no matter how, I guess you would call fancy or, um, uh, I don't want to say advanced, but, um, you know, cultural, our family of instruments are, say, in a symphony orchestra, uh, there are examples of those families of instruments in every culture, every civilization, from present time back to time, as far as time is, is recorded. Um, so... I want to just address the string because the string, okay, I'm a violinist, but the string um, sort of dictates a little bit about what our ears are, are um, culturally prepared to hear. And that is if we take a string and we divide it in certain intervals, we get different um, intervals above the bottom pitch. So, um, Molly, I, I sent a picture of a string, uh, like a string, and you can see on that um, photograph, you can see the different pitches that we would get when we start dividing that string. And most of us kind of think of this in music at least as like Pythagorean study of music, right? Good old Pythagoras, those of us who remember our, you know, the side squared is equal to the sum of the leg squared business in a right triangle. Uh, but if we look at that and we equate those notes with the piano, I'm going to actually ask my uh, friend here, <laughs> partner in crime, husband, uh, to play those notes for us so we can actually hear what that harmonic series is going to sound like. So if you keep cutting that string a little bit more, these would be the pitches that we would hear. So could you hear those? Yes. Yeah. So when you just play one C, just if you could play just that lowest C, we may not know it, but in our ear, all of those notes on the piano are being vibrated and sounded. So that kind of, I think, gives us a, a concept of what something that sounds soothing or consonant is versus something dissonant and great grating because our bodies naturally want to hear those tones. Those are what I'd call naturally produced 
tones because they come from that naturally occurring series of what we call overtones, tones over um, the, the basic pitch. It's kind of like um, the color white is an absence of all color and the color black is a saturation of all color. The bottom note is a saturation of all those tones above it. And our ear likes that. That's what we're sort of drawn to. Um, that kind of leads our, our brains, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but th those intervals, like, would you mind playing for us a fifth? That interval is very, very old as far as music goes. Um, there comes a, oh dear, there comes a time, didn't mean for my cat to attend the session. Um, there comes, a, there was a time in music around a thousand or so plus years ago where there was a teacher, Guido D'Arezzo, and he taught his singers um, the outline of that interval, the fifth, by numbering each one of his fingers. Uh, we know it as do, re, mi, fa, so, but he called it oop, re, mi, fa, so. And that to me is letting us know that even as far, ago, as far back as a thousand years ago, they recognize that interval as being so very important. So one last thought on the brain and sort of the natural um, universality of music. If you take water and you play pitches, the water will have a unique signature of each harmonic frequency. So, and you can look that up. They're beautiful, almost kind of remind you of snowflakes, but they, each, each pitch, each frequency has a different um, look, a different response. And when you think about the fact that we're mostly composed of water, you know, each human is, it's like these, these responses to music, I think, are natural and scientific. So that's a little, that's a little out there. Um, but to me, that, that's part of our discussion of how the, the universality of music relates to us as simply physical beings. Thank you, Marguerite. The next thing I was thinking about is getting back to the specifics of the, this topic. How do composers go about manipulating our emotions through music? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a, 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 another wonderful question. It's, um, it jumps a little bit, you know, unfortunately with 45 minutes, you know, the more you read, the more you want to read. Um, that, that's going to jump us a little bit in time. Okay. Um, but I think we also can look at how composers have evolved with that because you you're correct um, we have certain features that are what we would say music is made up of and that and that's again very you know all all in all music so we have a melody we have something that especially since much uh, very early music was um, text or wording set to music obviously the the melody originally was designed to help remember the text, remember the words. So if you think of, uh, for example, the Gregorian chant of around, you know, 900 to about 1,000 or, or 1,100, um, that Guido D'Arezzo, the guy with the hand, essentially did that so that he could point to his finger to teach the chant to the monks that he was with. Um, but the, the idea that there was a melody was sort of as a a memory device to help everyone say the words, the text together. Uh, and I think if we start, if we use that as a starting point, obviously music started long before that. Um, I'd like us to, with your permission, listen to a few examples just to, to see the way melody and then harmony and rhythm and repetition um, and then um, tempo, which would be speed, and how all those things are used by composers to start manipulating our emotions. So Molly, I'm going to call upon you, if you wouldn't mind, to play the plain chant that we won't listen to all. I do, I would say before you press play, if everyone can take a look at the notation, and if everyone, can everyone see the screen? Yeah. 
hopefully you can see the screen. If you take a look at that, you see that the, the little, what we, their notes, um, that's a very early form of notation. I'm sure a lot of you quick-eyed folks are gonna notice there's only four lines and not five. Uh, but that type of notation was very much de designed to match the wording. So if we can listen, you'll see how it fits in. Can you hear it? Molly, did you uh, click the use computer uh, audio? You, nobody can hear it. Hold on. Can you hear it now? No. 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 Hmm. Because what presentation <laughs> wouldn't have? <laughs> uh, Yes, if anyone's a teacher out here, we're all having similar nervous reaction because we may all be having to do this. <laughs> um, can hear you talking, Molly, just can't hear the thing playing. Yeah, interesting. Here, uh, chat, maybe something is helping me out here. In the screen share, did you um, include the use computer audio? Share computer audio? Yes, there we go. I see what to do now. Okay. And if, would you mind running it to the beginning? Yeah. Here we go. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus, Deus a meaning right but if we add now a little bit of harmony we are like oh this is a new kind of music this is a new kind of sound molly poor molly is having to jump around <laughs> so what we want to hear then is again now we're going to see a very simple melody but now with harmony that's good we're not we're, i know time is marching on so i do want to, to get to the others but that gives us an idea that just that one element changes sort of the the whole perception um, to me, um, if we jump forward 400 years and we jump to some Bach, you'll hear now we have a melody, but we also have harmony, but we also have what we would call counterpoint, lots of inner voices. And I think you'll see that from what we just saw in a very short period of time, we ended up with a much more complicated texture in music, um, that and this is something that's very popular but this this particular kind of music this is baroque music was very designed this is bach music so we're talking um 1600 to 1750 is about that time the time frame for that that music and 
you can hear already repetition is being used and rhythm is being used, right? Different kinds of rhythms. So Molly, just we're gonna listen just a tiny bit, but just to hear this complexity already based on the very simple harmony we just heard. <laughs> So I think already we can hear that the music's got more and more energy. It has more rhythm, right? We've got now this really, this strong feeling of, <coughs> excuse me, the strong feeling of drive, you know, the strong feeling of music pushing us forward. I think that sort of excites the listener. Our next one, um, something we may all have heard, it's actually kind of similar to the Bach, um, is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. In this case, Beethoven is going to use starts and stops to actually elicit an emotion, emotional response. So I don't think this piece needs much introduction. So if you don't mind, Molly, hit it. <laughs> I think all, many of us have heard in, in some version or another, we might have heard it recording or live, but again, like the Bach, there is repeated music. It's more and more exciting. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. As we, um, as we listen farther and farther, it gets like the Bach, more complicated, more driven. And I think that these are like the elements that, that make pieces become our favorites and become popular, is that they, they appeal to all of our senses, the, the, the physiological, the neurological. Um, the, the last one that I want to show, uh, when we may not get to watch all of it, I think is a perfect example of how music, this is a Bernstein piece, but it's played by the Simon Bolivar Orchestra, Symphony Orchestra of Venezuela with Gustavo Dudamel conducting. And I think you're gonna be amazed as you watch this. Um, concert hall etiquette in the 21st century um, actually I think goes against our human um, natural sensibilities because when you let the audience participate as much as the musicians, I think you're going to see how melody and rhythm and the energy and how everyone physically responding. You just gotta see it. So Molly, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
much. If you get a chance, watch it to the end because it's it's really exciting. Um, but I think you can see how that, you know, the chant had melody, that had melody. But it had more elements. It had that driving rhythm. It kept going faster. Um, but I think you also see that, you know, we're kind of trained for the audience to just sort of sit and take it strictly auditorially, right, just by listening. And I think just to see that audience, like, really into it, um, points to that human involvement, that, that physiological and neurological response um, that, that I, I think is just, again, cross-cultural. Thank you, Marguerite. Um, speaking of all of those aspects, the thing that has always gotten me really emotionally involved in a piece, because I'm a simple person, <laughs> is the melody. Mm -hmm. Catchy melody, a melody that moves me, a melody that I can remember, uh, is what really draws me to a piece. Can you talk a little bit about what makes a melody and what makes a melody memorable? Melodies that are memorable. I think um, when we think of the, the composers for certainly symphonic music that wrote melodies that were memorable, a um, few names come to mind. Um, Mozart comes to mind. He wrote beautiful melodies. Um, Tchaikovsky. So then the, the John Williams. Yes. Um, John Williams, who has, of course, uh, it takes these beautiful themes that he sort of attaches, these melodies that he attaches to certain characters. I think a melody in its sort of simplest form is a, is a short group of notes, um, usually uh, um, not a long, not long, but there's some element of repetition. And this actually, again, goes back to the science. Um, there are studies about how um, lullabies <laughs> that um, mothers sing to children, again, universally, not, not any other cultures, I mean, not one specific culture, um, how they are all within a na very narrow and same um, range of pitches. So if we have eight pitches in an octave, um, those melodies tend to be within uh, either five, four, three, two, one, you know, numbers five, four, three, two, one, or three, two, one. They seem to be very, very narrow pitches. Um, sort of along those lines, if you get a mob of people and have them sing something like, hey, oh, like at, at games, no matter where it is in the country or the world, people will sing on the same two pitches. Okay, so melody. Um, it tends to be uh, like a sentence in, in language. Uh, there's a beginning, there's an architecture, right? And then there's a, an ending. And usually it, it falls within a, a narrow band of pitch. So that's sort of uh, nutshelling what melody has come to mean for us. Um, for example, in the Bach we listen to, they're not really melodies. You wouldn't go away singing, da 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 There are rhythmic features that repeat, but not a beautiful melody. Whereas if we listen to, and, and the Beethoven is actually the same way. There's not a real melody there. Ba 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 ba, ba 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 ba. There, there are notes, but that's probably not something you'd be singing. It'll get stuck in your head. That's a different thing. But I'm talking about like a, a beautiful long melody. Um, I'm trying to, you know, think, think of a of a a good um, a, a good example that everyone. Well, Mary had a little lamb. I mean, there's a there's just a, a familiar song or, or Happy Birthday. That's a song that a lot of people know, um, and it's something that we would all be, you know, you're familiar with. So it's a a narrow melody. Would you wouldn't mind playing Happy Birthday? And yeah, half not yeah, major. <laughs> So we have architecture, we have a start, da -de -da -da. that goes back up to our main tone. We have structure, we get to that, that about two thirds of the way through where it's got the most tension and then it drops. 
it also reaches an octave. So we don't, we're not trying to go big, big giant leaps. So sort of broadly, that, that is melody. And um, melody is one of those things that's been studied, you know, throughout, throughout time. Uh, uh, there are all kinds of music theories about how everything can be compressed into just, you know, eight, eight notes uh, based on the melody and harmony. Harmony is a type of melody because harmony would be those same notes of the scale but stacked, stacked up rather than linear. Melody, we usually think of linear or horizontal. Harmony is usually vertical or stacked. So, Marguerite, we are about at uh, half an hour mark. And I know ah. 45 minutes when your time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. So maybe I could uh, drill down just a little bit, get more specific, and then turn it over to Molly to see if folks have put questions in the chat line. But okay, you no. Know, when when did you first know that music was going to be your passion? Was there some specific performance or song or experience that <laughs> kind of came to you and said, "This is what I've got to do for the rest of my life"? Yes. Um. I was at Interlochen, um, which at the time was called the National Music Camp. Now it's called the Interlochen Arts Camp. Um, I was in orchestra, and I came from a, a city that had a youth orchestra, but it was relatively small. It was primarily a string orchestra. Um, as I had gotten into high school, it was, it was um, bigger, but it was still relatively small. And I went to Interlochen, and here was this orchestra of hundreds of, uh, you know, people, uh, 10 bass players, um, you know, seas of cellos and violas and, and, and violins. And we were playing a piece by Ravel, Maurice Ravel, uh, Suite from the ballet Daphnis and Chloe. And I just remember sitting in the orchestra, you know, 16-year-old high schooler, just thinking, I can't take any more of this beauty and this is what I want to do. Like I couldn't believe how lucky I was and fortunate I was to be able to be part of that sound and that um, sort of led me obviously to playing professionally which led me to conducting um, but certainly the playing and, and being involved in the sound is what um, led me to the, the passion and the wanting to perform. And I will say, not because my parents did not try to talk me out of it. <laughs> so that actually leads me to another question that I had, unless Molly, do you have something from the audience? Not yet. Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead with mine then. So um, do you develop a, a different feeling about the music that you perform as a violinist versus what you conduct in front of a group versus the music that you listen to for pleasure. Yeah. Uh, well, it may surprise a lot of people that I don't, I don't listen to a lot of classical music just for pleasure, like background. Usually if classical music's on it for me, it's some level of analysis or, I mean, even if it's, you know, sort of like playing games with you know guess the composer or something there's always there's still something more professional as far as the take on it goes um i think performing music is probably one of those most wonderful things because it it defines that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts because each player in the group is providing a part a piece and sometimes it's a very important piece. Sometimes it's a, um, a, a minor but still critical piece. And I think that it's, it's being part of all of that, um, uh, you know, re relating in your part, your, your personality into this whole. And then the, the perceiver, the listener, is really only hearing the, the whole. Mm -hmm. um, when you go to say perform a piece your focus is maybe more on your 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 own part but you're certainly aware of what's going on around you or hopefully you are i think you know the best symphonies in the world you know we always joke about they don't really need a conductor but they don't and the reason they don't is because they are paying attention they know their parts cold they've probably played anything in front of them you know a hundred times 
So their focus is maybe 1% on their own part, 99% on everything around them. So it's like giant chamber music, you know, like really, you know, indiv individual intimate music making, um, even if it's with 70 people. So um, when you're playing a part, you're, you know your part, your, your line, when you're conducting it, you're hearing all of those and you're trying to help sort of mold it into what you think the composer wanted as far as who's important, who is a supportive role. And then when you're a listener, you're, you're perceiving it again in a very different way. Um, partly that's why I feel like all conductors should still perform and still feel the music sort of from the inside out. And then that helps you when you go out outside in when you're conducting, taking the whole and analysis and an, analyzing it back in to sort of decide how you want that whole to sound. I, I learned so much about the pieces when I see our performances on YouTube, because mm -hmm. I'm not a professional musician. I am focused on trying to play that second violin part as well as I can. <laughs> and then when I hear everybody in context, you know, I'm, I'm just blown away by the other pieces and I can see what you're doing in terms of trying to bring this out, tone that down, bring mm -hmm. that forward. It's, it's a totally different experience for me playing it and then watching it back. And it's, uh, they're both wonderful. So, as well, I, and you know, people will ask, you know, what's your favorite piece? And pro a lot of times you'll probably find yourself saying whatever we're rehearsing right now, yes. whatever we're practicing right now, because that's what you're reacting to. That's what your brain is involved with and studying and linked to. Yes. And it's not just linked intellectually, but you're linked mo emotionally. Um, I'm simple and I'm fickle. I go right with what's, what we're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, um, I think a lot of musicians experience grief after a concert and the loss of missing playing those pieces. Um, and I get both the, you know, the, the sadness after a concert. I look at my scores and they'll be like, I'm going to miss rehearsing that or miss hearing that music. Yeah. Um, because there isn't anything like experiencing it yourself. You can go back and watch a video or you can pull up recordings, but there's nothing quite like that personal involvement. And if you don't believe it, go and look at that uh, video of that audience. Um, mambo. In, yeah, with the mambo. <laughs> if, imagine if we started abandoning all the concert etiquette rules and just let people start like, woo! <laughs> It'd be rock and roll. <laughs> Maybe that's a thought for a concert theme. <laughs> Leave your inhibitions at home and really, you know, let yourself react to the music. Molly, did you have something? Yeah, we have a couple questions coming in from the chat. So um, let's see. All right, Daniel asks, what is an unpopular melody that you like that most people do not like? Oh, gosh. Um, wow. An unpopular melody? Um, that's a tough one uh, because there are a lot of things that I like. <laughs> so to have to try to find something that I don't like, it's a little hard to, to pull it out of the hat right now. Um, I would say that um, there are some composers I like that uh, are, are composers of some dissonant music or some, you know, things that a lot of people don't care for that I do like. Um, and a couple that come to mind, some Hindemith music um, has some, the Symphonic Metamorphosis is a piece by Paul Hindemith, and it's very angular, it's a little bit angry, and it's one of those pieces I find with musicians, they either love it or they hate it. <laughs> Um, and I'm one of the people who really loves it. It has some lovely melodies, but I would say the opening melody is a little angular and a little, um, it's a little unpleasant, but that's sort of the nature of the, of that piece. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think a lot of 12 tone music, which, you know, as a person with degrees in music, I think I, I still feel validated in saying that a lot of, um, early 20th century music when they were rejecting traditional harmonies and going into more of a mathematical approach. I can honestly say that although I find it intellectually stimulating, those are melodies that we were talking uh, yesterday, the Berg Violin Concerto um, has melodies 
um, very popular, but it, it doesn't it doesn't speak to me the way Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto or the uh, Korngold or Sibelius or Mendelssohn. It doesn't speak to me that way. So, and the Berg is very, very popular violin concerto. So I guess, Daniel, to answer your question, that, that I guess I came up with more than I thought I would. <laughs> and it's taste, you know, it's like, why do some people like green beans and some people, you know, they, they won't go near them their whole lives. And I think that somehow validating that, it doesn't make you more um, intellectually educated about the value of the green bean versus another vegetable. It's simply personal taste. And I think people with music get a little hesitant to say, I simply don't care for it, or I don't like it, or it doesn't speak to me. But I think, I think it's okay for audiences to say that. I think there is something to playing different types of music to help people develop their taste, to let the audiences hear what's out there. Um, and that's where you get into, if I could just sort of jump to like what becomes more popular. So those pieces that are more universally liked, if you will, tend to have um, what I would call consonant sounds. They tend to be major. They tend to be more, you know, uh, and there was a whole major minor thing I can go into, but just trust me when I say our bodies are trained to like major more than minor. It's a consonants dissonance thing going all the way back to our harmonic series. So we're, we're sort of pre-wired in a way to like certain types of melodies to like those certain intervals where we come pre-wired that way. And then there's context and conditioning, things that you've heard all your life. So, I mean, sound, there's songs and music that you've heard. So, um, but I think sometimes listeners, audience members are a little afraid to say that something is or isn't to their taste. So be bold, be brave. Molly, did you have another one? Yeah, I think we probably have time for one more, maybe. Yeah, we got three minutes. Okay, yeah, so we'll do one more. Um, all right, so Randy asks, uh, many popular classical music pieces have been connected with certain movies, TV commercials, and cartoon, to say the least. In your opinion, has the connection between music and media made classical music more popular, or has it simply created an environment that makes the music more relevant? Wow, that's a great question. Really great question. Um, <clears throat> I know that the Civic Orchestra performed some John Williams this spring, mm -hmm. and I told the orchestra, and this is actually kind of true, um, or it is true, <laughs> um, I always say John Williams saved orchestral music, symphonic music, because uh, E.T., the extraterrestrial, the movie, came out in 82, and at that point, music, um, especially soundtracks and science fiction, uh, movies were, were tending to be, there, there was a belief that um, as music progressed through the millennia, it would become more and more electronic based and less mel melodically based. Mm. So you had a lot of movies that had um, sort of unattractive kind of, of soundtracks, but they were very electronic sounding. And then when you had John Williams, um, it, with E.T., he again, he went to that idea of having themes. It's actually, you could go back to Wagner and talk about Wagner operas, but it's, that's exactly what he stole from or, or borrowed. Is, and James Horner, by the way, does the same thing um, as associating themes and things with characters. Um, personally, I feel like having, you know, Bugs Bunny has a lot of classical music. There was a cartoon called Ren and Stimpy that almost exclusively used classical music. Um, uh, there's some um, trying to think, uh, the Lacrimosa from the Mozart Requiem is used in, in a couple of commercials right now. Uh, I actually, the one thing that I like about that is sort of, I hate to say the normalizing of classical music and everyday experience, but I do believe there is something to the music being with movies, be it John Williams or, or any other composer, um, having that association of an emotional impact with, with the media, TV shows, um, you know, Downton Abbey, if you're a Downton Abbey fan, as soon as you hear that you know, very opening theme, you know, you, you know what's coming. So I think everyone um, is finding um, like a connection actually through all of the media use. Uh, personally, I think it's a positive. I don't think it 
Um, I, I think that the, what makes something popular is familiarity. And the more you've heard then in your background, and, and we're all sort of afraid of things we don't know. So if they become familiar to us and they're out there in the media, I think more people are gonna be willing to go, hey, you know, I'm willing to give this classical concert a chance because it's not completely something they, they don't know. They have that familiarity. Well, Marguerite, I want to say thank you so much once again for delivering a, I can't believe 45 minutes just flew by. I know. <laughs> and Molly, thank you so much for coordinating all of this and making it happen. And Nadine, behind the scenes, thank you for always keep, keeping us on track. And thank you everybody who attended today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your beautiful Sunday. Stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we'll be able to get together sooner rather than later. Yes, absolutely. Take thank care. you all so much. Thank Bye. you, everyone. And thank you for the technical support, Molly. Thank you, Cindy. My pleasure. Thank and you be sure to hosting. tune in next to our next um, lecture on August 16th at 3 p.m. And we're going to talk about the evolution of symphonies and symphonic music. Fun. And it'll be fun. I promise it sounds like, you know, a music history lesson. It'll be fun. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone.